We know what the scripture says, Matthew 24, 13, but he who endures to the end shall be saved. That word for endurance is not a, a, a passive acceptance of fate. It's not a, a, just a, a passive patience, but it's, it's an aggressive resistance. It, it literally means to hold one's ground in conflict, to bear up under intense adversity and intense pressure. You know, whenever there's persecution uh, for the faith or any other kind of uh, persecution, it doesn't even have to be for the faith, but whatever, uh, any kind of persecution, any kind of extreme stress, will it's like a pressure cooker, you know. It's like, uh, actually, in the scriptures, the word that's used, one of the words that's used for persecution, it literally means to press down, to take a bunch of loose like articles, like paper, like, uh, uh, you know, papers or any other loose type of article and press it down and compress it as far down as you can. Now, what happens when you, when you let that pressure off? It, it pops back up, right? It has to go somewhere. With all that pressure pressing down, it has to go somewhere. And that's what happens to Christians under pressure. Whatever is pressing you down, whatever is, is uh, the, the persecution or prosecution or whatever struggle uh, we deal with as believers, when it's pressing us down, everything that's in us is being compressed. When something is compressed, it is what? What is pressure, it's... it's it's intensified, right? Think about like, you know, you get them little tiny cups of coffee or whatever they are, you know. Yeah, espresso, yeah, that's it. It's intensified, right? It's, it's, it's intensified, and that's what it's like for believers under persecution or in any kind of hardship or that we may face as believers, and what I'm talking about here is this, that when we have all that pressure upon us, uh, pressing down upon us, what, what pops up is, is the, what's in our character. What's inside of us is what comes out. So you ever see, you know, the, the person that under great pressure, all of a sudden they, they let fly a, a, a flurry of, uh, you know, uh, uh, curse words or whatever else, you know, and just go nuts, you know, screaming at somebody. You know, it's all that pressure that's like that pressure cooker pressing down on them. And, you know, when you have a pressure cooker, steam comes out, right? And that's exactly what's happening. The steam's coming out. Only in this case, what's coming out are the character flaws that are inside. It's what we see. It's what we see. It's what happens. The, the, you know, uh, the, the character uh, flaws on the inside of us, they, they come out in those times of tribulation and times of uh, uh, trial. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. He who uh, perseveres under pressure, he who stands firm, he who waits calmly and courageously will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then will the end come. And you're having a, a part in that, in what you're doing, uh, in, in sponsoring uh, Reverend Sampson and the ministry in Nigeria and the uh, Christmas celebration in Nigeria. Lena's prayer dealt with the question of what, what would she give up? What would she give? for Christ, would she give everything she had, everything she loved for Christ? You know, Jesus said in the scriptures, he said, he who loves mother, this is Christ talking. So, you know, I know it doesn't, you know, in some ways this doesn't sit well, but it's true. He who loves mother, father, brother, sister, husband, wife, 
more than me is not worthy of me. Think about that. Let those words, you know, let those words drive home a little bit. There's nothing and no one in this life that we should love more than Christ. Those are his words. To love him like that, we must know him. We must appreciate as we were singing that song, uh, you know, the cross is enough. The cross is enough. In America, in America, with our affluence and our wealth, we've preached often a gospel of, you know, come to Jesus and you'll be blessed, right? Now, you recognize, I, I trust and I hope you recognize that's false preaching. That's a false gospel. Do you understand that? I believe in tithing. And I believe the scripture says that God will bless us if we tithe. I believe that, that God, it is God's ultimate desire and goodness to do good for his children in their lives. But how do we reconcile that with our brothers and sisters in Nigeria? facing the, the threat of, of uh, Boko Haram. Or, or those in, in, uh, in Iraq who were chased up that mountain by ISIS. Whose, whose, whose families and friends were slaughtered, whose businesses were destroyed, whose churches were destroyed, whose homes were destroyed, and they were chased up, the, uh, up that mountain, held on, on that mountain, if you will, as, as hostages, essentially. For no reason other than ethnic cleansing, and you do realize, listen, you have to wise up. Oft times when the media says ethnic cleansing, do you know what that means? Wake up, believers, wake up. Often it means the killing of Christians. They won't call it the killing of Christians. They don't want to upset the American public. They don't want the church to wake up for God's sake. We've been sleeping so long. What do you think's gone on in Syria? What do you think's gone on in Iraq? It's not a civil war. It's the killing of Christians and the attempt to eradicate the gospel from those lands. That's what's going on. That's who ISIS is. Listen, Abila Adamu and his family were awakened by the sound, this is from Nigeria, of someone pounding on the front door of their simple home in northern Nigeria. It was 11 p.m., well past the hour for a neighborly visit. So the only reason for someone to be at the door was an emergency or worse, an attack on their village. The pounding on the door was followed by the sound of men yelling for Habila to come out with his family. He rushed to get dressed, and when he entered the front room with his wife, Vivian, and their young son close behind, he faced intruders wearing robes and masks. One was armed with an AK-47. Habila said a short prayer to the Lord. After announcing that they were there to do the work of Allah, the men began to question Habila. They asked him his name, his profession, whether he was a policeman or in the military, and whether he was a Christian or a Muslim. I'm a Christian, he replied. Vivian was terrified, knowing the men were members of the Boko Haram. The intruders told Habila that they were, were giving him the opportunity to live and live a better life if he would only become a Muslim and say the Shahada, which is the Islamic profession of faith that includes the words, there is no God but Allah, and Muhammad is his messenger. They even asked him to join them as a member of Boko Haram. And all the while, Habila was prepared to die. I'm a Christian and will always remain a Christian, he replied. 
even to death. Turning to Vivian, one of the men said, if your husband does not cooperate with us, you will watch him die. And believing that her husband's death was imminent, Vivian cried out with fear and grief. The intruders repeated their offer to Habila, and he again refused. Your husband is stubborn, the man told Vivian. They asked her why she couldn't convince him to deny Christ and live a good life. Don't worry, Habila told his wife as the rifle was aimed at his head. The death of, death of a Christian is great gain, not a loss. That's what scripture teaches us. Paul wrote it. He said to die is gain. To die is gain. For a believer to pass from this, this life to the next is gain. It's victory. Ultimately, we, we, we all will. And, and when we do, we'll stand before the Lord. To, to, to die for a Christian is great gain, not loss. The men looked back at Vivian and demanded that she bring them all the money that they had. She scoured the rooms of their small home, grabbing anything of value that she could find in hope that the men would be satisfied and spare her husband's life. But it wasn't enough. The man with the AK-47 placed the barrel next to Habila's mouth. Since you refuse to become a Muslim, he said, here is your reward, and he pulled the trigger. Habila fell to the floor as blood streamed from his face, and Vivian cried out in horror. Shut up, woman, yelled one of the attackers. If you try to get help, we will find you and kill you and your child. And the men kicked Habila's leg to make sure that he was dead. Satisfied that they had done Allah a service, they chanted Allahu Akbar, which is Allah is great, and left the house. Minutes passed, and the pool of blood expanded around Habila's body. And as Vivian cried over her husband, she heard him gasp, I am still alive. Please get help. Her heart filled with hope as she rose quickly from the floor. She struggled to open the door of the fence in their yard before realizing that the attackers had locked it. She finally managed to leave the house and run to her neighbor's home. The neighbors called the police for help, but the police never arrived. Habila didn't get to a hospital until 6 a.m. the next morning. During that attack in November of 2012, Boko Haram raided the homes of more than 30 members of Habila's church. All of them refused to convert to Islam, choosing to die rather than turn their backs on Christ. Habila and his family were the only survivors. Think of that. Think of what that's like. Can you imagine? What if, you know, 30 members of, 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 of their church, a small Nigerian village, a community of Christians, were attacked and one family survived. Habila was transferred to several hospitals in an attempt to get him the medical attention he needed. When his medical records were later reviewed by uh, Voice of the Martyrs medical worker, Dr. Jim, he said it is only by God's grace that he survived. Habila was scheduled to undergo a bone graft to repair his cheekbone, which was destroyed by the bullet. But before doctors began the operation, they were shocked to see that his cheekbone had healed. There was no need for the graft. Today, Habila continues to share his testimony with others. When the voice of the martyr's uh, worker asked him how he feels about those who shot him, he said, we, we are all condemned criminals. Christ died for us. He loves us. That's why we must show love to the people that hate us. Since that day, I pray to God, God, forgive them. God, forgive them. My prayer is that they will know the truth and be saved, not to be condemned. I love them. Even if I have the opportunity to see them, I will hug them and I will pray for them. When asked how he could forgive the men who tried to kill him, Habila replied, because God is love. The God I am serving is love. He commands us to love each other. Voice of the workers, uh, via voice of the martyrs workers in Nigeria continually respond to persecution cases and assess medical needs like Abila's. Uh, voice of the martyrs established a first of its kind prosthetics lab in northern Nigeria to create high quality prosthesis for Christians who have been maimed in anti-Christian violence. Habila refused to deny Christ when faced with death. 
Others succumb to the pressure out of fear. But God is also able to redeem them. Some out of fear denied Christ in Roman's life. And you know, in all honesty, that puts them in pretty good company. When we're silent, at times when we should speak up, we join that community of believers who perhaps denied Christ at a moment of crossroads. Peter was in that community of believers. You know the story. How the night that Christ was betrayed and he was beaten and Peter was uh, around the fire in the wee hours of the morning just before the rooster crowed, people began to recognize him. They recognized him. They said, you, you were with him. You were with Jesus. We saw you. You're a Galilean. We know it. We saw you. You were with him. You're his friend. You know him. Peter said, I, I, I don't know him. I don't know him. And this was a matter of life or death. This wasn't like, oh, yeah, shucks. Yeah, I'm a, I, I was a friend of his. I used, I used to listen to him preach, but I didn't really, you know, uh, you know, I smoked, but I didn't inhale, you know. <laughs> you know what I mean? I know him, but, you know, I, I, I went to his church for 20 years, but I didn't listen to what he said. I didn't agree with anything he preached. <laughs> Political commentary. <laughs> But yeah, I, I, you know, I knew that Jesus character. I traveled all around Galilee with him, but, you know, I didn't really know him. This was a matter of life or death. This was a Habila moment, you know. No AK-47 present, but they just hadn't been invented yet. So Peter denied him. Not once. But several times, even a little while later, someone recognized him and said, I know you. I know you were with him. You were there when he fed the 5,000. I saw you. Do you deny it? I don't know him. You're mistaken. It was someone else. You, you, you know, all us Galileans, we look alike. You know? Someone else. Peter was feeling that pressure we talked about earlier. He was feeling that pressure. A little while later. I know you were with him. You're one of them. What came out of him? What came out of Peter? The Bible says he cursed. He swore. That, that pressure. See, that was still in him. He was walking with Jesus. Witnessing the miracles, perform miracles himself. You know, remember Jesus sent him out two by two. I'm sure Peter went out. Was one of them who came back laughing and joyful and having a grand old time. Lord, even the demons are subject to us. Hmm? Peter would have been one of those. So he had the mountaintop experiences with Jesus. Walking with him all over Galilee and all over Israel. But that was still in him. If it comes out, you know, the, the Bible says that what comes out of a man's mouth is what defiles, not what goes in, right? It's not what you eat. You can eat shrimp if you want. They're, they're okay. 
You know, I know they're the bottom feeders of the sea, but I love them. You know, you, 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 you can eat, you know, pork if you want. It's okay. It's not what goes into a man's mouth that defiles him, but it's what comes out. So what defiles a man? What he says. What he says. The words that we speak, that's what defiles us. And that was still in Peter. That was still in him. Because that third time, man, he couldn't take it anymore. The pressure was just too much. It was too much, man. He lets, he, the Bible tells us he let go a string of curse words. It doesn't record them. But it tells us he let them go, you know. And then the rooster... kind of putting that final stamp on it. Because Peter knew the words that Christ had spoken to him only the night before. It was only that, really that same night, the night night before, before the cock crows three times, you'll deny me. So Peter knew those words. He remember what Jesus said to him. Now, I know we don't face a firing squad. We probably will never face that in our lifetimes. But who knows? I know we don't face a situation perhaps where, where we have been asked to deny Jesus or die. I know we haven't faced that. I have never faced that. But I do know there are times when I've faced decisions. When I've had to decide, am I going to stand up for Christ or am I going to fold? There are times when I've had to decide in, in a moment of time, what, what will I speak into this situation? Because the opportunity is there, and we can be silent, or we can speak. You know those situations. You've been in them. You've had them. I'm sad to say sometimes I've failed. Just like you. I know that. Sometimes I've failed. Sometimes I haven't spoken up when I should have. Other times, I've opened my big mouth when I shouldn't have. <laughs> See, sometimes you gotta, you know, you gotta kind of weigh those currents. You know, which, 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 which is it—a time to speak or a time not to speak? But these brothers and sisters of ours, all over the world, are facing. Life and death times. Facing decisions that could cost their children their lives. That would be the hardest thing to imagine. It'd be one thing for a man to stand up and say, I'm a believer, take my life. But you know, it doesn't stop there. They take your life and they take your wife into prison or, or worse, you know, they kill them or they take them into uh, slavery. They take your children. They brainwash the, you know, that, that little boy in that Lena's prayer video that we saw. You know, if it, if it went that way, like in the video, and that little boy was there, they, they either would have slaughtered him or they would have taken him. And at the age of 10 or 12, he'd have been carrying an AK-47 with them because they would have indoctrinated him and, and, and trained him to kill. And there's no love there for that child. There's no love there. 
He's an expendable soldier. You know, that's, that's the way, that's the line of thought. You understand that, right? When a Christian family has killed their children, become slaves, and their, their, their sons are expendable soldiers. I mean, they're, they're from Christian parents. You know, so what if they get killed? Who, who cares? Give them a gun, teach them to shoot it, and get them out there where they can't be killed. That's the line of thought. It's not let's win converts for Allah so that we can love them and train them up in the way they should go. It's let's, let's, uh, let's forcibly convert them to Allah and give them a gun. And if they're killed, well, you know, oh well. But Jesus doesn't look on us in that way. Jesus looks on us with love. He gave everything that he could give for us. Now, I don't know, you know, these, these stories that I've read you today or, and that we've seen on video today, they may, they may seem like just stories to you, but they are the actual testimonies of what people are going through today for no other reason than declaring the name of Jesus. For being a Christian. That hasn't come here yet. Not in its fullness. I mean, we've seen a little bit of it. We've seen uh, random attacks by lone wolves. But we haven't seen this yet. But why is it that we feel that we're... Uh, invincible to it why is it that we feel that it can't come here you know we need to be prepared to face whatever we must face for him I started to read earlier uh, the words of Jesus and um, what he spoke mentioned how how he said that if um, if they persecuted him that they would persecute us and I want to think with you just for a moment about the one of the questions and and we won't spend much time on this today because the hour is is getting late. But I, w- I want to think with you for a moment about the what Jesus said to his servants. He said to be prepared to give an answer. He was talking to, talking to his disciples. And he said, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and they'll deceive many. He said, hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you're not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet. The end is not yet. Nation will rise against nation. Kingdom against kingdom. There'll be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. Now, you know, we've seen those things throughout history. Every generation of Christians applied these words to themselves. But today, you know, think with me for a minute. And, you know, 2,000 years ago, wars and rumors of wars uh, happened around the world but traveled very slowly to other parts of the world. You, you, you with me? They traveled by caravan. They traveled by uh, word of mouth via the trade routes. Today they travel instantaneously from around the globe straight to us. A passage of scripture that says that in the at the very end times that 
um, the prophet will lay dead in the street. There'll be uh, a prophet that'll be killed or lay dead in the streets for three days and then it'll be raised again. And that every eye will see this. That everybody will see it. And you think, well, how is that possible? But by television, literally everybody in the world could see basically, you know, what, what is happening in another part of the world. All over the world we see, you know, situations that happen in, in somewhere else in, in the world. Nation will rise against nation. We see that. I mean, we see it all over, and we've always seen it. And kingdom against kingdom, not just earthly kingdoms, but heavenly kingdoms, will rise against kingdom. The kingdom of Allah, and, and make no bones about it, Allah is not God. Allah and God are not one and the same. When we speak of God, we speak of Jehovah. We speak of the God of the Bible. You know, that God, that is not Allah. The Muslims do not worship the same God we worship. Make no mistake about it. If you believe that, you are believing a lie. If you believe that the Muslims worship the same God. It is not a derivative of the other son, Ishmael. Nothing to do with Ishmael. Not a derivative from him. Nothing to do with it. Make no bones about it. That is a lie that is being sold to the American people. It's being sold to the world. It is not true. But kingdoms shall rise against kingdoms. And there will be famines and pestilences and earthquakes. We know all these things. And all these are the beginning of sorrows. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you. And you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. See, never has that been any, any more true than it is today. For the name of Jesus Christ, people are dying today. then many will be offended and betray one another and hate one another. And many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness abounds, the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. And this kingdom, this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world for a witness. And then the end will come. We still have a ways to go. There are many places of the world where the gospel has not been preached. That's, that's the marker, folks. That's the marker. When the, the, the kingdom gospel, the gospel of Christ has been preached in all the world, that is the time marker. There's not a set day in heaven. God's not ticking off the days on the calendar. You know, it's not 25 days till Christmas, 22 days till Christmas, 21 days till Christmas. It's not, it's not like that. It's not like that. But it's in the fullness of time. It's when the, when the gospel of the kingdom has been preached in all the world to a witness. There will come a day when God the Father will say the fullness of time has been reached. This gospel of the kingdom has transversed the, the globe. Every people group on earth has had opportunity to hear. Then shall the end come. What is our part in that? Not to be afraid. Not to worry about it. But to be ready. To be prepared. To be ready for it. As it was in the days of Noah, right, then shall, uh, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. People be eating and drinking and giving in marriage and all of those things, right? 
And, and the world didn't know that it, <laughs> that it was about to be flooded until even the day that Noah went into the ark and, and God shut the door. Even when it began to rain, still they didn't know what was coming. Right? No man knows the day nor the hour. Except the Father who has it in, in his hands. He'll make the call. He's the umpire. And there is no instant replay. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Prepare your heart to give an answer. Prepare yourself to give an account. What would you say? If your life was in the balance, or the life of your brother, or the life of your sister, or the life of your mother, or your father, or your child, how would you answer? How would you respond? Let's pray. Father, we love you. We love you, Father. I pray, Lord, that you would give uh, Impact Christian Center such a lion's heart, Father, that we would would not be uh, bashful to speak the word of God, that we would uh, be quick, instant in season and out of season, Father, to, to speak your word, to speak your name, to speak your truth, to, to be bold, to be bold and face the, the lions of this world, uh, as it were, with the gospel of Christ, that we're not afraid. We're not afraid. Father, we, we just cast aside all doubt and fear, and we lay hold of that glorious hope of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Eternity spent with you, Father. Eternity with you, reigning and ruling in the heavens, reigning and ruling in the new earth. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your plan and your purpose for us, as, as you've stated in Jeremiah 29, 11. Plans to prosper us and not to harm us. Plans to give us hope in the future. And that if we seek you with all our heart, that we'll find you. That if we seek you with everything that's in us, you'll hear our prayer. Father, we love you. We bless you today. I ask, Lord, that you would fill each of us with hope. Father, your word in... in, in uh, Isaiah 59 speaks of a time when there was no intercessor found. Father, I pray that, that among us there will be intercessors found who pray for the church in persecution around the world, who will pray according to these scriptures that we've uh, uh, mentioned on this poster today. Who will use those as a basis to pray for the, the church in Syria, the church in Iraq, the church in, in, in Nigeria. Lord, I pray in Jesus' name for our brothers and sisters around the world that are facing these difficult times, who live in the midst of these war-torn areas, Father, give them grace. Give them faith. Give them hope. Give them peace. Father, we lift up uh, organizations like the Voice of the Martyrs who are, who are ministering to uh, Christians in these circumstances. Bless them, Lord. Bless them with finances to, to ac accomplish their, their mission and their work. Bless them, Lord, with, with workers who are committed, whose resolve uh, it is to minister to these, these believers in these circumstances. And Father, we pray for those, those workers who go into those battlefields with the gospel of Jesus Christ, motivated by your love to minister, 
to those who, who desperately, desperately need you. Father, we love you. We bless you. We honor you, Lord. We thank you for your goodness, all your good gifts that you have given us. In Jesus' name, amen. And amen. God bless you today as you go with God. Remember that serving God is not always the easy way, not always the easy thing, but it is always the right thing. Amen. Go with God.